Um, all right. How many of you are nervous to share your faith? Raise your hands. Okay, good. Nervous to share your faith. And today, we're going on the day of outreach. How many of that makes you just a little bit nervous? A little bit nervous about that? Okay. Yeah. Well, so here's the thing that I've learned over the years. There's about, uh, there's three different things that are really important um, and that happen in the life of a student who effectively shares their faith. Okay? And, uh, and, and when I say effectively shares their faith, I don't mean you, you lead hundreds of people to Christ necessarily. What I mean by that, effective evangelism is this. You're faithful to share the gospel in the power of the Holy Spirit and you leave the results to God. Okay? You're faithful to share the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit and you leave the results to God. So there's three things that I've noticed in students that are effective uh, evangelists for, for uh, sharing the gospel. Right? The first is they have, a, they have a rich theology of who God is and what the value of the souls of people are. They have a biblical understanding of, of who God is and of of what people's souls, the value of their souls. So they understand that. Um, the second thing is that they have training, which you've already got, which is they know how to share the, the Knowing God Personally booklet, and they know how to share their testimony. Okay, But there's a third thing that's really important in learning how to share the gospel effectively, and that is modeling. Modeling. Okay? And here's the deal. When Jeff and I were at Georgia... Um, we did the first two things really well. We really emphasized a good theology of sharing your faith and of God, and we gave them good tools to do that. But I personally didn't model well um, taking students out sharing their faith. And so guess what? My students didn't share their faith because they didn't see it modeled. And it, there was a girl named Megan uh, Long, who's now in Castleberry, who one day in staff meeting, she said, well, you know what we did at Florida was we would take students out sharing their faith and what we found was that they would actually come back and share their faith with their friends and lead their friends to Christ. And all of a sudden, I was like, oh, that makes total sense, you know? Students aren't sharing their faith because we're not taking them with us to share their faith. And so, um, when I went to Georgia Southern, I incorporated that in our ministry there, and, and our students do see a lot of people come to faith. So, I want to preface this the day of outreach with this. We're not doing this because we think this is the most effective way to share your faith is to walk up to people um, and ask, say, hey, I have a five-question spiritual survey. Would you mind taking it? Some people are going to be like, no. Some people are going to say yes. And there's people that you say, you should get into a spiritual conversation with them. And then some of those people actually surprise them will become Christians. In fact, we were at Miami on spring break doing this over uh, spring break, obviously. And... Um, <coughs> And I was just totally looking at it as a training exercise. I took the student with me, and we're, you know, we do the asking the spiritual questions, and sure. And then we get to the end, it's like, well, would you like to know how to have a personal relationship with God? And he's like, yeah, I've been really thinking about this a lot lately, and I just don't know anyone who knows Jesus. So, yeah, I'd love to know. We're like, okay. Um, you know, it's great. We're well, you know, you going to do it, you become a Christian, you know? And so the thing is, the main reason we're going to do this thing today is to really give you modeling and training so that you can share your faith when you go back to campus. But, surprisingly, God can still use this to bring people to faith. So don't doubt that He can, but it's also the main purpose of it, you know, is actually modeling. And so, but, but before we go do that today, we're going to talk more about all that, okay? Uh, before we do that, I want you to have a good theology of evangelism and sharing your faith, okay? So, I'm going to pray. I'm going to give you about 20 seconds to ask God to prepare your heart, then I'm going to pray, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the psalm we're going to be looking at today, Psalm 67. I pray that it would be rich that we would see the riches of it, that we would see um, how much you love us, that we would worship you, and that we would respond and send us out to, to be on a mission for you. And I just pray you prepare our hearts to do that today. And as we have fears and um, worrying about things being awkward, Lord, I just pray that uh, 
you would help us to see the value of people's souls and more valuable than our comfort. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. So, we're going to be in Psalm 67 today. And uh, if you, if this is kind of the tip of the iceberg for you, you kind of really want to get deeper into uh, evangelism and this particular psalm, um, I would encourage you to read the book uh, by John Piper, Let the Nations Be Glad. Um, it can help go a lot deeper than what we're going to be able to go today. Uh, but the psalms, someone told me when I was in college that uh, to really read a psalm a day, and, and I have done my best to be able to do that, I'll tell you what, it's one of the best spiritual practices that I have done, because the Psalms are deeply emotional, and if you want to learn how to grow deeper in your emotional connectedness to God, I would really encourage you to camp out the Psalms, read through it, and let that inform, let that begin your prayer time. Before you have your prayer time, read a Psalm, and let that kind of push you in the direction of your Psalm, it just, it will really radically change your prayer life. And so, you're going to kind of start off with that. And, to, and today, we're going to be talking about the blessed life. Now, that word blessed, we use it in a lot of different ways, right? What are some ways we use the word blessed or blessing? Come on, say it out. Speak it out. Bless your heart, right? Which, if you're not from the South, some of you are. If someone tries to set you up on a blind date and they say, he's really nice, bless his heart, you don't want to go on that date. That means they're like the biggest dwarf in the world, okay? So we say, bless his heart. What else do we What else is bless me? Hashtag. Hashtag, bless life. Which, what does that mean? I got, I got something that I wanted, right? I got, I got a new boyfriend, a new girlfriend, a new car. Hashtag, bless life, right? Yeah. What else? After you sneeze, and we say, God bless you, right? Which is like we're scared that they lost their soul or something, and then it's like going to help them get it back. You know, what, what does that mean? We're going to be looking at what the word blessing means, okay? Psalm 67. Um, it says this. May God, bless, may God be gracious to us and bless us, and make his face to shine upon us, that your way may be known on the earth, your saving power among all nations. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. Let the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you judge the peoples with equity and guide the nations upon the earth. Let the peoples praise you, O God. Let all the peoples praise you. The earth has yielded its increase. God, our God, shall bless us. God shall bless us. Let all of the earth fear him. All right. So this word blessing is used all throughout the Bible. Old Testament and New Testament. And what the word blessed means is that God is with us. It means God is with us. And in the Old Testament, it meant both physical and spiritual blessings um, because there would be plenty of times where God would be with them spiritually. Um, but it also had physical, it meant physical blessings in the Old Testament as well because um, the, the point of God blessing Abraham or others in the Old Testament uh, was so that the nations would look at God blessing them and would go, man, their God's pretty cool. I want that God too. And so that they would come and inquire about this God of the Israelites and, uh, and that they would want to worship Him too. So in the Old Testament, it's both physical and spiritual blessings, meaning that God's with them, He's for them, but it emphasizes physical blessings. In the New Testament... It also means physical and spiritual blessings, but the emphasis is on spiritual blessings. Let me give you a couple Bible verses. Ephesians 1.3. You can pull that up on the screen. Um, Ephesians 1.3 says this. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Uh, what are some of those spiritual blessings that we've got? We, we kind of talked about them some today. What are some spiritual blessings that we've got? That if we're in Christ. Come on. What's that? We've been made pure. We've been made pure. We're adopted for the Spirit. He's always with us. We're righteous. Or we're holy. We're forgiven. We're loved. All of these things, right? Amazing stuff, right? That is, means that we're blessed. Right? And, and we've been given every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Alright? But the, the New Testament also talks about physical blessings. James 1.17 uh, says this. Um, 
Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, who there's no variation or shadow due to change. And so, yes, um, you know, I, I'm married. I have a wife, and she's a blessing from the Lord. I have a children. That's a blessing from the Lord. I, I have food to eat and, and a shelter over, you know, our house. Those are all blessings from the Lord. And so, yes, God is with us. And we're going to be talking about what this means in just a second. But the reason, the reason that God blessed us found in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. And this is what it says. Actually, I want you all to read this with me, okay? And this is God speaking to Abraham, all right? And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a Okay, so God blesses us so that we can just hold all those blessings and just keep them to ourselves, right? Right? No. He blesses us so that we'll be a blessing. That's the whole purpose of every blessing that you have is that God has blessed you so that you would be a blessing. Financial blessings. He doesn't give you financial blessings so you can just selfishly spend them on all of your pleasures. He gives you financial blessings so that you can be a blessing. And he gives you spiritual blessings so that you can be a blessing. Every blessing he's given you is so that you can be a blessing to others. Okay, I'm going to show you, uh, you have that video, can yeah. you pull that video up real quick? Okay. We're going to watch this video, and just stop it about three minutes. Um, we're going to watch this video, you might have seen it before. Um, it's a guy that randomly walks up and gives a, hundred, a homeless guy $100, okay, which would be a big blessing for him. And we're going to watch what he does with that, all right? Sorry, it's hard to see back here. When you give homeless people money, do you ever wonder how they spent it? Today I'm going to give a homeless guy a hundred dollars, and I'm going to follow him and see how he spent it. Hey! I'm hey. doing how are you? I'm, I'm Josh. Josh. Nice to meet you. Yeah, I just read my name out to give something. I just want to like, give back to people. Yeah. No, not be that much, but... Hey, anything for free. Oh, good. It's just a hundred bucks here. Oh, no way. Yeah, just keep it. It's your money now. That's... Just you know. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, yes. I'm trying to cheer up. Oh, okay. That's like... It's okay, it's all right. I thought you were going to buy that alcohol or something. 
But those things money can't buy. I, I get a happiness out of what I'm doing. No, no, no. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm fine. No, you. you. Alright, so. <coughs> when you first saw walking in the liquor store, you were like, I hate Jay Bosley. Why didn't you show me this video, right? Because you're like, that would have been such a waste. You got this hundred dollars on and it's exactly what they're just going to waste it on himself. But he didn't do that. He was given this amazing gift of a hundred dollars and he knew what he needed to do. He needed to be a blessing. And so what we're going to be looking at is we are blessed to be a blessing. That's the whole purpose of the Psalm 67 and that's where we're going. Okay? You ready? Yeah. All right. So the first thing we see in Psalm 67 verse 1 says, May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face to shine upon us. Okay, what we see first is that God blesses us so that we will enjoy and worship him. You see, what the psalmist says there is he's enjoying and thinking about the graciousness and the blessings of God. And what he wants is make your face to shine upon us. And that's that, uh, that idea of God's face shining upon us. It is personal intimacy and relationship uh, with God. And so when he experiences blessing and, and the grace of God in his life, he responds with wanting God's relationship with worship. And we go on also, and we're going to see just the response of praising God. Okay? When, when we use that word worship, that word worship means to ascribe worth or value to something. Okay? To ascribe worth or value to something. And so the reason that we're in here and we're singing and we're worshiping and just ascribing worth or value to God is because we have been given these blessings, right? We've been given forgiveness. We've been given grace. We've been brought from death to life. We were lost, and now we were found. We were slaves, and now we're sons and daughters. We've been given all of these amazing gifts. And what that does is it stirs in our affections a love for God that we actually want to worship Him. And so the first, if you can pull up the first diagram, yeah. The first thing is that blessings, when we meditate and think about the blessings of God, it leads us to worship and joy because we are just amazed that the God of the universe would do that for us. For us. So our initial response is worship and joy. We just are amazed that he would do that for us. Just like, did you see the homeless guy? His first response when he got that gift, because he cried, right? And he goes, can I hug you? You know, he just was so, he just wanted to express his gratitude for what the guy did for him, right? And that's what worship is. Worship is just like, God, you can't. Can I, I just want to, I want to hug you. I want to worship you because I'm just, I don't even know what to do with this amazing gift. So the first step is that we respond to God in his blessings in our life by worshiping and enjoying him. And C.S. Lewis, um, he was a Christian author. Um, he, he, this was his biggest problem with Christianity because he was like, it just seems selfish. So the whole point is that we would get these blessings from God so that we would just worship Him. Like, does God need our attention or something? Like, what? And they had this big problem, this barrier in his relationship with God. But uh, you can bring that C.S. Lewis quote up here. But this is what he says. I had never noticed that all the enjoyment spontaneously overflows into praise. The world reigns with praise. Readers, their favorite poets, players, praising their favorite games. I had not noticed either that just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value. I'll say that again. Men spontaneously praise whatever they value. So they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. Isn't she lovely? Don't you think that magnificent? The psalmist, in telling everyone to praise God, are doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. I think we delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but complements the enjoyment. The delight is incomplete until it is expressed. And, and the, you know, if we don't meditate on the blessings of God, then we're not going to enjoy it or worship it. And so the, 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 the challenge, the application of this part is, are you taking time every day to enjoy God? Are you taking time to enjoy God? And you do that through meditating on what Christ did for you on the cross. Because 
even if someone did something amazing to me, let's say this guy, he was amazed by what this guy did for him, right? But if no one, if he didn't think about it, if he didn't talk about it, if he didn't do anything about it, a couple, you know, a couple months go by, he's going to forget all about it, right? But if someone reminds him, they go, hey, you remember that $100 you got? Then all of a sudden, he's like, yeah, that guy was amazing, right? And in the same way, we are so easily forgetting of what Christ did for us on the cross. So when we remind ourselves of what Jesus did for us, then we can again continually respond with joy. Which is one of the reasons why we spend time every day reading the Bible in prayer. It's not to get Jesus points, okay? It's to remind yourself of what Jesus did for you on the cross so that you can worship Him and enjoy Him properly. And the reason we do this is because our tendency. As Tim Keller says, is to view God as a vending machine. Or we do our little thing, we put our thing in, and we expect something in return. We want to get what we want to get. And we view God as a vending machine. And we value the blessings of God because we get what we want to get. Kind of like, a, you remember at Christmas time? And you, you, all, you wanted that gift, and all you did, you were just thinking about the thing that you wanted over and over and over. And sometimes... Because you're selfish, you don't really even think about the fact that it's really your parents giving to you. I'm sorry if you still believe in Santa. I know I just blew that one for you. But, but you forget that really your parents are the giver of that gift. And you enjoy your parents as the one who's given you the gift, right? And God wants to give us gifts. He delights in that. He loves us as children, but He wants us to enjoy Him as the giver of the gifts. And we don't need to value the gifts more than the giver. And we have to watch our heart because that's my tendency and it's probably your tendency too. And when we do that, we can find deep joy in God. And it's not that you're going to be happy all the time. I think sometimes people think joy in God means you're just going to like, yay, something terrible just happened to me, so I'm just going to smile. No. What it means is when bad things happen, when storms come into your life, that you know that God is with you, that He is for you. All right, but then finally, and, and uh, don't put the chart up yet, finally, worship of God leads to mission for God. I want you to say that and say, worship of God leads to mission for God. Okay, now here's how a buddy of mine, David Robbins, puts it, lovers tell. I want you to look back on that wall, and I want you to see what Jeff wrote up there that says roll tide. You see that? Okay, now Jeff loves Alabama football. He loves Jesus.